Who were Germany's communist generals who turned on Hitler and decided to join the Red Side? How did they become influential in the formation of the East German army? And what was Hitler's role in an army that was created after his death? Welcome back to Nutty History. Today, we'll be going back to East Germany in the wake of the Second World War and looking at Hitler's Red Generals. In 1942, the German army was fighting for control of Stalingrad in southern Russia. The five-month-long Battle of Stalingrad was the bloodiest battle of World War II, incurring roughly two million casualties. On November 19, 1942, the Germans found themselves cut off and surrounded by Soviet forces. On February 2, 1943, they became the first of Hitler's armies to surrender. Why? Because they never practiced their strategy in Call of War. World War II is raging, and it's time to take control of your country in the true cross-platform grand strategy game. Build up your defenses, expand your borders, make alliances, master espionage, and build powerful armies to prepare for the ultimate confrontation against up to hundreds of players at once. Call of War offers a true experience of the intense battles of World War II in real-time strategy as you battle for weeks on huge historically accurate as well as fictional maps. Call of War is available for free on Android and iOS, and you can also play it on PC with a browser. Download the game now for free from the link in the description below and get an exclusive gift of 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription absolutely free. The offer is available only for the next 30 days, so do not waste time. Download Call of War for your devices now. The reason behind the surrender was Hitler forbidding the army from trying to fight back and break out. His only priority was keeping a hold of the city. The trapped German forces found themselves exhausted, running out of both food and ammunition. The Soviets took 91,000 prisoners, including 22 generals. Only 6,000 of those prisoners survived the gulags. Now, understandably, many of these generals blame Hitler for the horrors they endured. How could he do this to them? Why hadn't he let them fight their way out? Didn't he care at all? Did those friendship bracelets mean nothing? So, naturally, many of them decided to stick it to Hitler by collaborating with the Soviets. Among the first of these was Walter von Seidlitz Kerbach. Seidlitz Kerbach fought in World War I and its disappointing sequel, World War II, The Hitlering. Earlier in the war, he commanded a division that was trapped on the Eastern Front, surrounded by Russian forces. He helped his men escape and was promoted for it, so he got the foolish idea that his job was to help his soldiers. Big mistake. When he fought at Stalingrad, he and his men were similarly surrounded. He thought they should either surrender or fight their way out, but Hitler somehow wanted neither. No fight, only win. But Seidlitz Kurzbach told his officers to choose for themselves whether or not they wanted to surrender, so he was immediately relieved of his post. He fled to the Soviets while being shot at from his own side. The Soviets captured him and saw his potential as a possible influencer, in a time before influencers were all about skin care and bikinis. They sent him to a political re-education center, where he was further indoctrinated with the radical belief that maybe Hitler wasn't the best, and then placed him in prisoner of war camps, where he enticed other soldiers to abandon Nazism and join the Red Team. Within these camps, an organization called the National Committee for Free Germany was formed by several German prisoners of war and exiled communists. This anti-Nazi organization sought to open negotiations for peace and punish Nazi leaders. It wasn't getting much traction, though. So, Seidlitz Kurzbach started the League of German Officers, which was meant to be like the National Committee for Free Germany, but without all the riffraff. It was an exclusive club for generals. Both the Soviets and the Germans used him in their propaganda, and he was sentenced to death in absentia by Hitler's government. The Soviets eventually lost their enthusiasm for him and charged him with war crimes. After five years, he was released to Germany where his death sentence was nullified. German veterans hated him for his Soviet collaboration, so he did not receive any parades or pensions. A co-founder of the League of German Officers was Dr. Otto Korfis. Korfis was the son of a pastor and studied philosophy. He joined the army in 1909. He fought in World War I, where he was promoted to the rank of captain. He resigned from active service in 1920, but World War II had other plans. Korfis was promoted to lieutenant colonel for the low, low price of being in the German army during their famously unfun war. 
He fought near Stalingrad, and we now know by now that it didn't go terribly well for the Nazis. Corfus was, like almost everyone, captured by the Soviets. He was eventually released back to East Germany, where he joined the National Democratic Party of Germany, and in 1952, he became Major General of the Barrack People's Police. His brother-in-law was a Hitler resistor who was murdered by the Gestapo after being brutally interrogated in prison and found to be a key conspirator in the July plot against Hitler. Another general who was not too pleased with Hitler was Arnold von Lenski. Von Lenski fought during World War I with the Imperial Army, then as part of the Nazi Army, where he rose to the rank of Lieutenant General during World War II. He was captured at Stalingrad and joined seidlitz kerbach's League of German Officers. In 1949, he was released to East Germany, where he was formally acknowledged as a victim of fascism. Must have felt weird pinning that thing on an ex-Nazi. Von Lenski then joined the Barrack People's Police, which was succeeded by the National People's Army, which was the Army of East Germany. Another Nazi turned red was Rudolf Baumler. Baumler was enlisted in the Prussian Army and fought in World War I. He became head of counter-espionage for Germany's intelligence service and encouraged cooperation between the Gestapo and the SS. During the Second World War, he rose to the rank of Lieutenant General. He led battles on the Eastern Front before surrendering and defecting to the Soviet Union in 1944. He then returned to East Germany, where he was a major general in the Barrack People's Police and also had a career with the Stasi, the highly repressive state police force. All in all, it's an inspirational story of a man leaving behind his violent old Nazi ways to try a totally different kind of state violence. Let's talk about Vincenz Müller, who was another of Hitler's exes. Born in the Kingdom of Bavaria, Müller fought in the First World War, where he was injured by a grenade and contracted typhus and malaria. He stayed with the German armed forces after the war, since he'd been having such a great time of it so far. He did well there, eventually being promoted to Major General and contributing to Germany's mobilization system. He also helped to plan Germany's invasion of the Soviet Union, opening up the Eastern Front to become the largest theater of war in history, proven disastrous for all sides. In other words, he helped to plan the worst thing that's ever been planned. Imagine putting that on your resume, maybe under special skills. In 1944, Mueller was in charge of 100,000 troops and surrounded by Soviet forces 100 kilometers behind enemy lines. Mueller was confident that a breakout might be possible, but when he attempted one, he was caught by the Soviet army. He advised the remaining troops to surrender, and the Soviets earmarked Mueller as someone who might be amenable to influence. Within days of his arrival at a prisoner of war camp, Mueller joined the National Committee for Free Germany and seemed to be an enthusiastic anti-Nazi and communist, maybe hoping to change the conversation from whose idea was the Soviet invasion in the first place. Soon after, Mueller was released from captivity and got into politics as the chairman for the National Democratic Party of Germany. He was also vice president of the East German Parliament known as the Volkskammer, which in hindsight wasn't the most PR-friendly title. Mueller then rejoined the military on account of being a glutton for punishment. He was appointed as chief of staff of the National People's Army and also worked to establish the National Police Force. However, and maybe this has something to do with him becoming an anti-Nazi communist right after being caught in a war that he helped construct, there were uncertainties about Mueller's political affiliations. Mueller supported a degree of separation between the National People's Army and the Soviet Army and was also courted by the West to switch sides. Perhaps the simplest way forward was the one that Mueller chose, retirement. In 1960, he was hospitalized for schizophrenia just as allegations were surfacing that he'd ordered the decimation of Jewish and Soviet prisoners of war during his time in the war. In 1961, right before a return to the hospital, Mueller fell off his balcony to his death in what was rumored to be a suicide, because who survives two world wars just to accidentally fall off a balcony? These Red Generals leave a complicated legacy. They denounced Hitler, but only when it became convenient and only after serving him for years. They were instruments of police and military forces that were violent and oppressive in their own right, though some of them tried to mollify tensions between East and West. They established the National People's Army, which was respected internationally. 
Maybe the main lesson here is that no matter what your past or what war crimes or decimation you've helped to carry out, the Stasi has a place for you. What surprised you most about these generals? Let us know in the comments below. We hope you enjoy learning about Hitler's Red Generals and the East German Army, and we'll see you next time for another Nutty History video. And don't forget to download Call of War and experience the intensity of strategy and decision making in World War II by yourself. For 30 days, the game is offering 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription to all of you for downloading the game for free with the link in the description below. Choose your own strategy, engage in epic battles, and take over the world.